Tech, author of three books, and an international teacher, speaker, activist, and national contributor, where she's written several articles, and by the way, she's only 14 years old. At 12, she delivered the speech, What Adults Can Learn From Kids, at the TED Conference. That video received over one million views, bringing a unique perspective to the often mysterious world of youth and social media Adora is going to talk to us about how millennials are using digital to shape the future. Please join me in welcoming Adora to the stage. I'm so glad to be here at the Mashable Connect. Um, it's such an honor to be speaking to this audience. And I really enjoy writing for Mashable. Um, I've written a couple articles, and it's just such a wonderful audience every time. Um, not to mention that it gets tweeted a lot. So yay for um, good publicity for articles. <laughs> So I just wanted to start by um, thanking everyone here at Disney as well for the amazing service and the food has been awesome, as I'm sure all of you know. Um, and today I'm going to be covering this issue of really how youth are using digital to shape the future. A little bit of a disclaimer on the title that's in the program about millennials. I wasn't entirely sure if the millennial generation encapsulates 14-year-olds. I think it does, so <laughs> hopefully it's pretty accurate. Now I want to start with a couple of images. Twilight, The Hunger Games, Harry Potter, Glee, Facebook, Tumblr. So what do all these have in common? Well, I think that what all these things have in common is us. That is, a significant youth base, whether we're readers or audiences, participants or creators. This century, you might think, is really the century of young people rising. When some of the biggest books and movies, TV shows, and movements are driven by me and my peers, it's of increasing importance to listen to what we have to say online and off. Some digital and cultural trends I've noticed as a high school student include really using online technology to teach our elders, setting cultural trends and norms by creating and sharing content, and perhaps surprisingly for the generation of eye rollers, participating in the causes that we believe in. For starters, how many of you guys have heard of this? Raise your hands if you've heard of Teach Parents Tech. Wow, actually surprisingly few of you. So Teach Parents Tech was an initiative launched by Google to send your parents a technology care package um, in case your parents or maybe your grandparents are just getting online. Now how many of you have helped a parent or grandparent with technology in some form? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of raised hands, right? Now most audiences that I speak to is the other way around, or it'll be like how many of you have had your kids help you with technology? But considering that everyone I've spoken to has either toddlers or no kids, I didn't think that question would quite work. So, <laughs> yeah, even though my two-year-old cousin, Maya, she started using an iPad like, and immediately knew how to use it, which I thought was kind of crazy. Um, so that's really kind of showing how we're starting early and earlier. But that's Teach Parents Tech, and I think that it really evidences this new trend of students, um, really kids, taking on the teaching role when it comes to technology. You know, it used to be that um, it might be the other way around. So my family provides me with a great study of contrast when it comes to digital usage, and probably many of you have a portrait of your own families that's somewhat similar. So let me start with my mom. This is her over there, and she uh, came here with me. Um, we were just posing in front of Google. Don't work there. <laughs> but yeah, I wish for all the free food, right? But my mom is really probably considers herself a relatively early adopter. I say considers herself because I'm not sure if the rest of the family agreed, but. I mean, let's say she was on Facebook from like the very beginning um, after it went public and then she also got Facebook timeline really as soon as she could and she uses her iPhone, she listens to podcasts, she's really up to date on everything or at least tries to be. Now my sister Adriana, she's 16, she uses Facebook but she also uses her phone a lot for texting and uses memes, listens to music on her iPhone. I'm somewhat similar to my sister, except that I use technology tools for a slightly more educational, from a slightly more educational viewpoint, which is a fancy way of saying I don't spend all my time procrastinating on homework online. But my dad is definitely the black sheep in our family. Why is it the black sheep, by the way? What is like wrong with our sheep analogies? Anyway, this is my dad. <laughs> and he worked for Windows Mobile for a really long time, but was so refusing to get a cell phone. He was like, I don't need a cell phone. I'm not supposed to talk in the car. I have a phone at work. I have a phone at home. And you know, this is a guy who works building cell phones, so it's more than a little ironic. When he finally joined Facebook, we were really actually a little bit shocked, but then surprised by how quickly he took to it and how much he liked it. But the awesome thing was not just that my dad actually liked Facebook, 
But the fact that suddenly, here was this authority figure in the house who was always the expert on everything. He was like our encyclopedia when we wanted a more long-winded answer than Google would give us. He knew about everything from physics to literature to you know, mythology and stuff, and we would ask him about all this. And suddenly, our dad was the one asking the questions to us. And to be in that role was suddenly empowering. We got him posting on walls, answering questions on Facebook, even playing Angry Birds, which I thought was quite a milestone. Sure, he still hasn't switched over to timeline, but I don't know if that's necessarily an age thing. Sorry, Facebook. <laughs> now, of course, there is one downside to parents being on Facebook, and that's when things like this happen in the digital world. You can see that these, the, these are dads of the um, girls who are going to prom. And they're like, oh, what are you doing over there? Now, this is something that happened in real life. It got uploaded to Facebook under the title, Creepy Dads. And <laughs> what happens is that dads can be creepy on more days than when girls are going to prom. They can be creepy by liking every single photo that you post. But there is a solution for that when you do as my sister did, which is put mom and dad on the family list. And much as in real life, the family list is the Siberian exile of Facebook lists. Okay. <laughs> Listening to kids, though, isn't a bad thing. It actually puts you in good company. I heard that President Obama listens to Willie and Sasha for recommendations on which funny YouTube videos he can watch. So even the commander-in-chief takes cues from his kids. I think that this is a really telling portrait of new digital culture and of many families' habits. And youth are setting trends with other things that we do on our computer, tablet, and smartphone screens, too. Only in our time could a video of a teenage girl singing get so many views, oh, more than the Super Bowl uh, got on television this year, which took decades to establish its prominence in American culture. And Rebecca Black got more views than that. How many of you have heard it? Yeah, and I'm guessing like the rest of you who didn't are just raising your hands so you can be like, oh, let's hope she doesn't show it. <laughs> However, so I will spare you from Friday, Friday. Okay, you can tell I'm like worse than Rebecca Black. But there's a new Friday in town. Take a look at hot problems. Okay, you can close the ad, maybe. <laughs> intelligence um, with enhanced interrogation methods. However, on a different tack from Hot Problems and Friday, Hot Problems, by the way, wasn't quite as popular. got 20 million views, which I still think is like a crazy number, um, for, which really shows that people are willing to go through. But isn't that catchy? Hot Girls, we have problems too. Sorry. <laughs> on a different tack, I gave this TED Talk, What Adults Can Learn From Kids in 2010, and it received um, almost a couple million views now. And it was really probably more influential than all my teaching, writing, and speaking up to that point combined, which I think goes to show how much the playing field is being leveled for um, people my age, as well as really everyone. Access for producing content, getting our message out, and consuming content. We don't necessarily have to wait to be discovered by a TV show. It used to be that your, your chance of making it big was to be discovered, to be a model, to be in a movie, to be in a video, but you can get millions of views and people to love you or perhaps detest you, <laughs> in the case of Rebecca Black and the girls and hot problems. They made it as a joke, by the way. Um, and I think that that really does level the playing field a lot. Now, in my own experience, as far as consuming content, I still love watching TV, and perhaps that makes me the black sheep a bit here. Also, I subscribe to The Atlantic, um, not in digital form. 
I get it as a magazine every month. So um, yeah, I'm a little bit strange in that regard, but we don't have to wait to watch what we want necessarily. I wait for the Atlantic and nightly news, but I also check CNN.com intervals throughout the day. So if you were to look at my browsing history, you'd be like, wow, this girl is seriously obsessed with news. And if I want to watch funny YouTube videos with my sister, or if I have the need for the beauty and luxury of British noble life, which is, believe me, a need as essential as food and water, I can head over to Netflix and stream Downton Abbey. And I can go to Wong Fu Productions on YouTube with my sister when we want to procrastinate on homework. Now, who here has watched Wong Fu Productions before? I'm seeing a few raised hands. What? There's like no Asians in this room then. Okay. Um, <laughs> Wong Fu Productions is like kind of a cult favorite of a lot of people from a certain continent of origin. Um, now, I will say though, I know one white person who has watched this. So yeah, there's, there's hope here. Wong Fu Productions is really funny, no matter what your ethnic background is. That's what we do to get laughs. And the great thing is that we, while my sister is like a fan of a lot of TV shows like Glee, we don't necessarily, again, have to wait to tune into that. We can really get our comedy fix whenever we need it. And you also probably know about how Facebook is being used for social purposes and entertainment purposes, but you might not know that we also use it as a sort of study hall. This is my AP Art History class, and we post complaints about teachers, reactions to the art documentaries we've seen. Um, the art history exam is actually coming up on Tuesday, so it's high stakes time right now, posting a lot of resources for that. And this isn't something restricted to just my one class. Almost. Uh, every like AP class at Remnant High School and a lot of ones around the world really I think are using Facebook whether it's AP honors regular classes it's not really something limited to only some schools or only some classes this is a very wide-reaching trend people will use chat even to ask friends for homework help so these are very unofficial student-run non-teacher monitored things that have kind of just risen up because someone was like well I'm on Facebook already why don't we use it for educational purposes as well so you know about Friday and hot problems in my TED talk, how we watch videos and use Facebook as a study hall, but what are other ways of creating content? You probably know what I'm talking about, memes. When I log on to Facebook, memes are absolutely inescapable and I really enjoy looking at them and talking about them. I was sitting with Brian at dinner um, on Thursday and we got to talk a little bit about like, uh, who, is, who here has seen Ridiculously Photogenic Guy? Seeing some raised hands, awesome. Those of you who have not seen Ridiculously Photogenic Guy, you need to look it up, it's awesome. Um, now when I log into Facebook, you'll see images like troll faces, which I'm not sure is technically a meme, but this is really a world that my parents don't quite understand. When I say something like doing it for the lulz FTW, they're like, what did you just say? Particularly if I follow that with just to troll. And when my art history classmate posted this reaction to a documentary entirely in popular memes, I was laughing pretty hard because, well, for one thing, it was a crazy documentary. But for the second thing, my, my mom was like, what's going on here? And memes? What is a mem? So I guess that kind of evidenced my point. Oh, and that one, by the way, I actually looked it up to find where it came from. And it came from uh, the astrophysicist talking about Newton. And he's like, oh, when he did this all before, he was 20 with the Solaris hand with it. So yeah, these memes have really interesting origins. Here are a few more of the memes that I see a lot. That one, Art History Hedgehog, is not like a viral meme. It's just sort of an art history cult thing. <laughs> I love the um, Desi memes on Facebook, even though I'm not Indian. I eat a lot of Indian food, so I get some of the Gulab Jamun references. <laughs> so these are just, um, this is a sampling of some of the things that I see when I log on to Facebook or Twitter and people are sharing. It's memes like this that are instantly recognizable to a lot of my Facebook friends, but as I said before, my parents don't quite understand this world. In this new world of sorts, where young people are reading celebrities tumblers and posting pictures and sharing and Instagramming and doing duck faces on, t on Facebook, and you seem like that, it's actually really stupid. But, but the point is that we're no longer sitting back and waiting for adults to tell us what to read, watch, make, participate in. Although I suppose that you could say, looking back at history, that we never quite have. What are the implications, you might ask, of this new digital culture of youth and marketing between brands and products and young people? 
Well, luckily for me, I have a 16-year-old sister who I can kind of mine as a resource. She's more of the archetypal teenager than I am, or perhaps I should say stereotypical, as in she loves hanging out at the mall, going to concerts, going over her data limit. We would like make the perfect family for rollover minute ads or whatever. Um, so I asked her about her experiences with social media and marketing. And see, she said, well, I've never really seen someone use, say, a viral meme to advertise something that would work really well, but it's kind of impossible to just purposefully start a viral meme, just as it is very difficult to purposefully start a viral video. Quite honestly, perhaps the product or the spokesperson for the product that teenagers have gotten the most exposure to via memes is this guy. And some of you might recognize him. Anyone recognize this guy? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Dose Equis, right? Now, of course, everyone knows that we teenagers are like totally the target audience for beer. Um, okay, actually, yeah, we sort of are. No. The, this is an example of me using him in the most interesting man in the world meme, as it became called, was just all over the place. But a lot of teenagers are seeing this, and it's really weird because I highly doubt that Dose Equis just was like, oh, let's make this meme and evilly reach out to young people's social networks. So perhaps it's a more useful idea of what actually purposefully creating something viral can look like. Some of you may remember Old Spice Guy. Did any of you watch the Mono a Mono in El Baño, the uh, Old Spice Guy versus Fabio? Raise your hand. Yeah, I'm seeing some raised hands there. Yeah, really into the Old Spice thing. So this was a strange, rather whimsical advertisement, and it spread really quickly. A lot of you guys know it. And I don't have a solid figure on how many teenage boys probably started using Old Spice because girls were like just circulating this all over, but it's a perfect example of purposefully starting something. Entertainment value can even be found in a meme around Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Raise your hand if you've seen texts with Hillary. Okay, it's an awesome Tumblr. I, I mean, like Hillary Clinton was already my idol, but so many of my peers actually saw Secretary of State's cool factor because of this picture of her like intensely texting with sunglasses on, and then everyone turned it into a meme and wrote all these ones. So um, apparently she thinks Mark Zuckerberg should get a shirt with a big boy collar. <laughs> now on the surface, you can use this uh, very easily. You can see how young people are taking charge in social media, really appreciate the entertainment value of memes and videos and all this. And you can leverage that power. Ask teenagers to tell you about their consumer experience to really get um, data from the source. And reach out to us in ways that make sense and seem cool. But I think that there's one problem with that. All of this does is sell us something, a lovely product, a movie, a game, a site, a service, whatever. And quite honestly, I think that we can be in this for more. I think that my peers deserve more than products to buy or places to visit, sorry Disney World, I love you, alluringly wrapped up in beautiful advertising. My peers and I, we need ideas to share and causes to believe in. We need opportunities to lead and people to teach. When we buy a shirt or a mug or a beverage, we also want to buy a lot more than that. We want to buy this and this and this and this, be part of community movements, be part of something larger. It's why Tom's shoes are so fashionable and Project Red is cool. Moreover, we need opportunities to empower ourselves and have larger platforms. I Love Contest is a great example, um, which I guess is one of the oldest things in the book, but I've entered so many PBS ones, NPR's Three Minute Fiction, New Poet Society Contest. I've entered these again and again, even though I know that I probably won't win. And I got to know lots of products and programs through participating in these contests. Just take a look at Doodle for Google, the Google Science Fair, the Pepsi Refresh Project, Microsoft Imagine Cup, the Adobe Youth Voices campaign using video to reach out to underserved youth. And you might be skeptical about the individual impact of one contest on a social network, but just take a look at the example of my friend Hannah, who participated in a Vans Shoes Design Contest. This is what she drew on them. And when she posted her initial design and then the finished product on Facebook, she got almost 40 likes practically immediately, plus someone saying, if I pay you $100, will you let me keep them? Someone else said, I'll buy some white vans if you can make me some. This is just one person's social network. If you imagine this on every single contest participant's social network, you can imagine the enormous impression such contests can make. President Obama met with the winners of the Google and Intel Science Fairs, and the Intel Science Competition semi-finalist Samantha Garvey received tremendous attention because of her inspiring story of overcoming adversity. 
Now, from talking to a lot of you, I know that quite a few of you are directly involved with social media and public relations, whether at large companies or with agencies. And I'm interested to hear about your experiences with cause marketing. So please take a moment to talk to your neighbor, ask them if you've done any cause marketing efforts, and then I'll come back with and just hear from two people about what you've heard from your table. And with the introduction of Disney's Animal Kingdom, uh, the idea was to how do we how do we raise money to help support wildlife? And so any of our registers can make a purchase. You can add a dollar onto your purchase and that money goes directly to the Wildlife Conservation Fund. It's been great because we've been able to really help out a lot um, over the past several years. Awesome, so Disney's Wildlife Conservation Fund, love that, great. And let's get one more. Okay, so. You um, have heard some great examples of cause marketing already being utilized um, with some fairly large companies. And really utilizing the power of a good cause to raise awareness about your brand, but really to do good for the world, can be a very um, genuine way to engage with your audience. Because when young people see a company doing something really good, not only do we think, OK, that company is um, actually fairly decent, but also we want to be a part of it. So thinking not only about what you're doing, but also how you can bring us in can be an important part of that equation. Now you might be hearing all this and thinking, well, you know, that might be true, but the teenagers I know or the teenagers I've heard of, they don't seem all that deep. They're texting and they're using these undecipherable abbreviations. But we actually do invest ourselves very deeply if we believe in a cause. Dove reached a lot of teenage girls very effectively with the True Beauty campaign. At the TEDx Drive-In Conference, my friend Maya Ganesan started her talk about girls and body image with that video and everyone really loved it and felt very affected by it. And uh, Aldo Shoes did an AIDS awareness campaign, which really achieved success because it used um, spokespeople that young people were familiar with, like Christina Aguilera. I read this quote stating, in a 2006 Cone survey of consumers aged 8 to 24, 8 out of 10 said they will purchase a company's product or service if they think the company is engaged in a cause that is relevant to them. 79% said they will recommend a company if they know it's engaged sincerely and deeply in a cause and will recommend it to other people. That's one of the key areas as well because when you saw earlier with like the van shoes and the contest, people don't just buy something or, and be done with it, they'll share if they really like something enough. Organizations giving students opportunities to work and lead others is also always welcomed, as I said, really bringing us into the causes. Staples partnered with DoSomething.org recently. Um, yay! Woohoo! Which is an organization that really empowers students to take action in your community um, as well as in your world to do good things. And I think that that's really the future, not just when we saying, okay, we're going to, say, donate X amount of money, but also bringing us as consumers to become change makers. This isn't just something that large companies are doing. Um, also, Wong Fu Productions, that awesome YouTube channel that I mentioned earlier, they have a website for their clothing brand called Are You a Nice Guy? And they donate a big pro a portion of proceeds to charity as well as trying to get people to really uh, fit into that nice guy ethos, which I think is pretty awesome. I think that one of the reasons that Wong Fu has had that success with this is that they understand there's a certain idealism that a lot of young people, um, despite our, you might think that we've gotten jaded at this point, but yeah, there's still a lot of idealism there to tap into. And companies do gain this recognition when they send out positive messages and participate in causes that we believe in. But it's also about the carrot and the stick. Because when we see companies doing things that are just icky, uh, they will receive attention from me and my peers. A great example of this came really recently, actually. I was doing some work for TEDx Redmond, the youth conference I organized. Uh, you might have heard June Cohen speak. The TEDx program is awesome. So I was making this list of all these companies that we might want to work with. And one of the we have 20 teenage committee members, and no adults really work on organizing it. My mom um, helps us as a liaison with sponsors. But anyhow, we, we have this TEDx Redmond list of companies. And someone said, can we actually avoid this company? I really don't like the way that they depict women. And a second one added, and this company, different one, has had links to slave labor in Asia a few years ago. So I was like, wow, that's really putting that knowledge that you gain from watching the news or reading your Facebook news feed to good use. Because not only do we share things that we really like, that we care about in a positive way, we also share things that we hate, that we see as wrong or evil or things that we can uh, take action on. Perfect example of this comes from someone you might think is an unlikely source. Miley Cyrus, um, former star of the Disney show Hannah Montana, she recently tweeted, or not super recently, it was a while ago, on Urban Outfitters, which had don made a donation to, I think, Rick Santorum's organization, which had had some uh, fairly 
radical stances on gay marriage. She said, one that everybody is hating on urban outfitters. Not only do they steal from artists, but every time you give them money, you help finance a campaign against gay equality. I thought that was really awesome, and for the first time, and I think a lot of people like me, also saw Miley Cyrus as someone who could take action outside of maybe the very bubbly, um, slightly shallow character on TV. And I think that seeing this, you see how Miley Cyrus, not the first person you think of as a meaningful activist, but someone who became a meaningful activist because of this tweet. If you go beyond us Instagramming our mirror pictures and making duck faces and your Facebook news feed, this is the new possibility for what youth involvement can look like, something like this. Now all this, our positive responses to genuine causes and involvement, our negative responses to companies doing bad things, speaks to the greater civic awareness of my generation. I remember that Cindy Gallup was talking earlier about the new transparency of our online world as it relates to companies and brands, and I think that young people are becoming a part of this trend to really wanting to see and know more about the companies um, that we buy from. When you see chats like, hey, what's up, nothing much, yo, it doesn't strike you as, okay, these are the kids who are going to save the world, these are our new leaders and things like that, but you have to, again, look beyond the surface because this is a picture of what I saw when I opened up Facebook this morning. Uh, my friend from Biology, Kendrick, posting, okay, I'm raising money for the American Cancer Society through Relay for Life. Hattie, making donations on Kiva and sharing it and really pushing for friends, tagging people actually to say, hey, sign up for Kiva. We can use peer pressure in destructive ways, and we can use it in amazing ways. This is the possibility for what we can do on our social networks. Now hearing all this, and reminiscing on your teenage years, perhaps some of you may be feeling a little bit like underachievers for not, like, I don't know, raising money all the time, except for P. Cashmore, who was founding Mashable, of course. You probably remember rolling your eyes at adults, partying a lot, actually considering this crowd probably watching Star Wars in your basement. <laughs> Sorry, Ooh, that, was, that was bad. Yeah, I know, I should not have dissed you guys. Star Wars is awesome, by the way. Um, yeah, but honestly, okay, I know. I, I figured I'd already made enemies of you guys' pop pops. Okay, honestly, we're still much the same. We can do things like this, and we can do things like that on the same social network in much the same minute or hour. But the possibility for mobilizing youth involvement by getting us to be conscientious about the causes that we care about, really sparking that sort of action, is, uh, provides huge potential. And I'm seeing a lot of organizations take notice of this. Organizations large and small. World Food Program, which I represent as a youth representative, um, uses freerice.com. How many of you have played free rice? Quick audience poll. Yay, okay, everyone who hasn't, since all of you are on your computers, you might as well go to freerice.com. And what free rice does is very unique in that it donates rice to sponsors. So teenagers, you know us, we're so cash-strapped. <laughs> we don't actually have to like use a credit card and donate, but we do good by using our smarts, which I think is fairly unique. The great thing is that it's easy to use and it's shareable. You can play with your friends and battle against other people and classmates. If you take a look at the recent phenomenon of Coney 2012, obviously the organization itself has been the subject of some controversy, but the effectiveness of their methods in reaching out to young people is unquestionable. In this day, I saw across my newsfeed, plastered everywhere, Coney 2012, watch this video, click this link, and it was amazing because a lot of the people who posted this video were young people who I had never thought cared anything about current events. And again, I was proved wrong, I was just looking on the surface, but beneath, you know, there's amazing things waiting to happen. Now, imagine Coney 2012 for a second with no youth involvement. It wouldn't be possible. Now ask yourself, what movements are there waiting to happen that are Coney 2012s without youth that can do good things and really have momentum and power? And how can we start them? Clearly shown by movements like Coney 2012, we have increasing power not just as media generators and consumers, but also as people who will push movements forward. Adults used to be the only one at the ones at the helm, and this really isn't true anymore. Young people are demanding change in the media that we read. Julia Bloom on change.org demanded that Seventeen magazine publish at least one photo a month, one photo a month, with a girl who wasn't photoshopped to look thinner or have better skin or blonder hair. And I think that this is something that really shows our increasing power and the momentum that can start. She has 40,000 signatures. Again, if everyone goes to change.org and signs it, maybe you can get her to 50,000. And youth like Julia are stepping up and urging responsibility on the part of the companies and media organizations that we are affected by every day. 
But I truly do believe that I and my peers deserve a little bit more than a lovely product to buy. There can be deeper meaning when we go sh uh, shopping at the mall. And since we're not so far from the magic kingdom, it's fitting that we mention uh, that maybe we need some better princesses, metaphorically and literally. You see, when I was little, like any girl, I wanted to be a princess. I loved reading about Cinderella, Snow White in the Doors, watch the movies and everything. But quite honestly, the type of princess I wanted to be was a little more Elizabeth I than it was Cinderella. Because Elizabeth I had her mother beheaded when she was three. I'm not saying I want my mom beheaded, by the way. I just like that. Um, she had her mother beheaded when she was three. Her half-sister, Mary, comes to the throne and walks her up in the Tower of London where she has to face the prospect of execution. She overcomes all that and she never gets married. Like, that is a crazy, awesome story. On the other hand, Cinderella, who is also lovely, um, wonderful, overcomes adversity, there's a great moral there, um, does it more by having to be nice even with mean stepsisters and sitting pretty waiting for Prince Charming to rescue her, which is not quite solid career planning. <laughs> On the other hand, you look at Elizabeth I and you have quite a different story. So I would say there's nothing wrong with princesses. If they do some self-rescuing and country rescuing, maybe too. And if you're more on the side of the proletariat, you can give us like superheroines who aren't from the aristocracy. But the point is that we need role models for boys and girls. It's not only um, something because I'm super feminist. It's also a thing about really having role models who show that you can accomplish what you want with substance, not just style. And that the world belongs to the kind and the smart and the just, not just the pretty. Ask yourself, is a world with young people and companies deeply involved in causes and leadership where you no longer strictly isolate the stuff you buy from the causes you champion, a world that you would like to live in? Imagine if you could really look up to the people that you see on your screens. What if a major company like Disney crowdsourced and utilized the power of youth to bring us into causes or maybe even invite us to create a new 21st century hero and heroine who represent the stories and strengths and challenges of today? Imagine if every time we consumed, we weren't only contributing to the bottom line of a company, but also making a positive difference in the world. Those archetypal teenagers hanging out at the mall could become leaders of social good, meet the new superheroes. But the real secret is that the new superheroes won't just be teenage girls and boys out shopping like the girls in this photo. The real secret is that you can find the real superheroes when you look in the mirror. So let's pull on our leotards and make a better world of creating, consuming, causes to believe in, and ultimately culture. The culture of my generation and many more to come. Thank you. Whoa.